Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. Well, uh, the title was not clickbait. Uh, I did indeed get kicked out of Karis. Karis Bible College that is led by Andrew Womack, a word faith slash NAR prosperity preacher. So this is going to be a bit of a longer video, but I've got a lot in here. I'm going to show you the facilities at Karis. I'm going to have clips from Andrew Womack and some of the other professors or instructors there. Anyway, uh, teaching, show you some of the problems with their theology. Uh, some of what I show you in here will be sad. I'm going to show you some of the wildly unsubstantiated claims that they make, and uh, it will be kind of towards towards the end dish or so, last third or so where I talk about how I actually got kicked out of Karis. So all of that is in here. So, uh, so please do uh, stick with it. Watch it all the way to the end. For a little bit of background, uh, I was asked to preach at Highland Bible Church, pastored by a really, really good guy, Jeff Gwynn, just a wonderful, wonderful brother. He had me at his church three years ago in October, October of 2019 to do my seminar, Clouds Without Water. And I did, uh, we went to Karis Bible College there in Woodland Park. This is literally in the shadow of uh, Pikes Peak. Well, I guess it's probably north, just north of Pikes Peak. So maybe not technically the shadow, I guess, would be more to the east. But at any rate, um, right at the foot of Pikes Peak. And so I went there three years ago. We went in to look around and just kind of, you know, observe and talk to people. Those of you who know me uh, and know of my ministry, you know that my teaching against the Word Faith Movement is not just an academic exercise for me. Uh, I go to these things. Uh, this is my this is my heartbeat to rescue people out of this deception. And so I've been to eighteen or nineteen Benny Hinn Crusades. I've been to Kenneth Copeland meetings. I've been to Joel Osteen's church. I've been to Joyce Meyer. Uh, conferences. I've been to Jesse Duplantis and da 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 da. I've been to a lot of these things, and I go there to re for research, yes, but I also go to get in the trenches and talk to people and um, just hear them and listen to them, and then reason with them from the scriptures, so that by God's grace they would be delivered out of this just horrific word faith deception, and so. Um, uh, I went there three years ago, and now about nine months ago, I put up a video on my YouTube channel entitled uh, My Visit to Karis Bible College or something like that. I'll put a, a here's a screenshot of, of the thumbnail, and uh, that's going to play in he here in just a second as I go along, and I think I'll, I know why, uh, why I got kicked out. So at any rate, we uh, uh, Jeff Gwynn asked me to come back just this past week to Highland Bible Church, his church and do my seminar, Clouds Without Water, again. And it's uh, it's it's common. I get asked by a lot of churches who have invited me in to do Clouds Without Water, and then some years later they'll invite me to come back and actually do it again because they have a lot of new people in their church and you know kind of a new crop and, and people need to hear this. And uh, it's a little bit unusual to be asked to come come back so quickly in just three years and do it, but, uh, but he did. And and I was, of course, happy to do it. There's such dear, dear, sweet people there at Highland Bible Church. And with them being in the same town as Karis Bible College, Andrew Womack's uh, outfit there, uh, there's an especially acute need, I suppose, because Woodland Park is a small town. I think maybe only uh, seven or 8,000 people. And uh, Karis... They have at this point, I believe, eleven or twelve hundred students enrolled, and so Karis is a, a huge influence in this little town. They have an outsized influence because of the of the small size of the town that that they're in, and so he asked me to come back, and uh, so I was happy to do that. And this past Monday, May the second, we went to uh, Karis Bible College to uh, look around again and. In fact, it was it was me, it was Jeff Gwynn, and a few other uh, members there from the church, and this was all kind of prearranged, I guess you could say. Jeff called Karis Bible College and asked if he and, and some of his friends could come 
and I look around and they said that, yes, sure, come on by. And so we did. And we went through, we got into the um, driveway there, the, the parkway driveway going into the to this uh, compound. Now, now this is about, as best I can tell, it's about 500 acres. This is a massive, massive place. The road into the Bible College is almost a mile long. You go through this little uh, security guard um, gate here. You kind of check in. And so so we did, and, and no problem. We go in there, and uh, it's a brand new facility. They've been working on this for a number of years, and it's now completed. I think they will soon be uh, working on some student housing. But um, the, the main facility, the main auditorium is complete. And uh, you just cannot imagine the size of this place. In fact, I found a video that uh, details, kind of gives you a little tour of it. They did this shortly after construction was complete. Um, this is, uh, now in fairness, I have been told that Andrew Womack lives in a modest home. And uh, a couple of different people told me that. And so I have, I have no reason to doubt that that is true. And that he does stand in contrast, at least in that regard, to uh, other word faith preachers like Jesse Duplantis' home parsonage that is 35,000 square feet. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, I think his parsonage is 18,000 square feet. Uh, just most of the Creflo Dollar has an indoor swimming pool in his home. And so most of these, almost all of these faith preachers have opulent homes. But uh, according to what I've been told, Andrew Womack does not have that. It's a, it's a very modest home and that very well may be the case. But I can assure you there is nothing modest about this uh, facility, about Karis Bible College. It is extreme. It's huge. Not only is it massive, but it is very ornate, top of the line, everything. Here's a, a few clips just to kind of show you uh, what we're talking about. Welcome to a special edition of the Andrew Womack Video Newsletter, your source for all of the first looks behind the scenes and inside stories taking place all around the world. I'm third year media school graduate, Jessica Giamo, and today we're giving you a special tour of the newest building to our Colorado campus, the auditorium. Now let's go check it out. Underneath the large portico shear, we can fit four cars side to side and six cars end to end on top of heated concrete that helps keep snow and ice from building up in the winter. Let's go take a look inside. Here we have the reception area of the auditorium building. Andrew and Jamie were personally involved in the design process, including the building materials, its mountain decor, and even the placement of the Dove logo in the floor. They also helped design the terrazzo flooring that stretches across 45,000 square feet around the building. All of the wood you see is real. Even the posts are wooden logs that have been split in two, hollowed out to allow for the insertion of a steel beam and then put back together. Okay, I wanna pause here just for a second. All, and she's right, all of the wood in there is absolutely real. And, and can you imagine, I would love to know just how much that one post costs. It's unbelievable. Even the handrails going upstairs and down the aisles in the auditorium are cut wood. I mean, this is high-end, high-dollar stuff. The concourse has an upper and a lower level and can seat around 1,200 people for in-between classes and conference events. One of our Karis Bible College graduates, David Larson, saved this ministry a lot of money when he designed a virtual tour of this building, enabling Andrew to make decisions on details before construction began. Andrew even changed the wall colors because of this video, and the main staircase was moved over to allow for more space. Through here is our bookstore that has Andrew's teachings as well as materials from our guest speakers. This also serves as our student services room during the Karis Bible College school year.
Andrew designed the two-story waterfall so that the slate tiles would layer a quarter of an inch, making the water bubble and keeping the noise level down. Its pump runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and draws very little electricity. So a two-story waterfall and the water bubbles, and it runs 24-7, 365, but at least it doesn't use much electricity. So they're, <laughs> they're going green. There's a salt water mixture that's used to keep the water clean without giving it a strong chlorine smell. All of the moss rock you see is real and was hand laid by our construction team on site. I listened to the name of that rock twice. I, I still couldn't make it out. I don't know what it is, but uh, she said it's real rock. So this this is expensive, hand laid. So a lot of labor. This is This is high end stuff, high end construction, no corners cut here at all. Behind me is the west entrance to the auditorium, and this balcony stretches all the way across the south side of the building. Behind me is our Karis Legacy Wall that represents just a portion of the students who have gone through Karis and are now out changing their world. You may even recognize some of the names. Here's another look at our waterfall from above. And behind it is one of two cafe stations that are located up on the balcony. If you come visit our campus for any of our special events, it's safe to say you won't go hungry. Here we have another view of Pikes Peak, as well as the first phase of our building project called the barn. We also have plenty of overflow seating available, as well as television monitors that show what's going on in the auditorium. Through here, we have our Andrew Womack Ministries Phone Center, where we are currently able to have around 144 people taking calls at a time. But most people may not know what all ministry happens in here. Alongside our prayer ministers, we also have people who take crisis calls and customer service calls for people who are needing help ordering product or signing up for Karis. Did you catch that? She said that we have 144 people on staff just answering calls, answering phone calls, 144 people. Sometimes people will say to me, well, Justin, don't you think Word of Faith is on the decline? It's not as popular now as it used to be. I wish. I, I wish that were the case, but sadly it's not. Uh, this movement is large and it is growing. And I, I tell people, if you want to get us an idea of the state of Christianity in the world today, then all you need to do is turn on Christian television because all Christian television is, is a function of supply and demand. Whatever the demand is, that's what they're going to supply. So when you turn on TBN or you turn on Daystar, who do you see? You don't see John MacArthur. You don't see Steve Lawson. You don't see Phil Johnson or Mike Riccardi or Vody Balkum or Jim Osman. You don't see any of those names. You don't see expositors. Who do you see? Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, Joseph Prince, Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis, Andrew Womack. We also have staff who are answering doctrinal questions responding to emails and social media posts, sending out teachings through our prison ministry. One thing that the Word Faith Movement, unfortunately, does really well is getting its theology into the prisons. You just heard her made a re make a reference to their prison ministry. Uh, I have, over the years, have had uh, two or three opportunities to present at least a part of my seminar in some prisons in different parts of the country. And uh, one of those occasions, I was in Texas, a prison in Texas, and uh, the inmates were actually really, really nice. But uh, when I left, I did my seminar, a portion of it, and when I left, I got a call from the, um, from the chaplain a couple of days later, and he said, Justin, the trash cans were full. He said, after you left the next day, the trash cans were full of Kenneth Copeland books, Joyce Meyer books. Joel Osteen books. Um, after I came in, the inmates saw my seminar. They went to their cells, or uh, I guess the cells, not the church, li or the uh, prison library, but they went to their cells and they trashed all of their Word Faith books. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, 
Word faith theology is huge in the prisons. And you also heard her say that they answer doctrinal questions when you call in. If you have a doctrinal question, don't call Andrew Womack. And out the back, we have an entrance to Andrew's newly finished parking garage. Andrew's 336,000 square foot parking garage is five stories tall and can park 1,085 cars. There are three outside entrances and exits like this one, located on levels one, two, and three. Now let's take the elevator down to level two. Okay, I had to laugh at that. That sign that you see there, that's not just a clever, you know, take on the handicap parking signs that you see everywhere, but that is actually the cover of one of Andrew Womack's books, uh, God Wants You Well. Uh, this is a foundational principle, foundational teaching to word faith theology. In fact, it is key to its success. So uh, more on that later. As you walk through the parking garage, you'll notice beautiful murals that have been painted by some of our Keras students. And you'll also notice that they actually do have real handicap spots. Now, I, I know they're probably required to by law, but I, I, I can't help but find the irony in that is that the place that is renowned for its faith healing and faith healing theology has handicap parking spots. While this auditorium can seat around 3,200 people, it was designed so that no matter where you're sitting, it still has an intimate feeling. During construction, this entire room was covered in scaffolding to allow the crew to put up the white clouds that cover the ceiling. On November 3rd, 2018, Andrew dedicated the auditorium building alongside Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis as people gather together to celebrate the miracle of the sanctuary property. Okay, so we'll let slide her misuse of the term miracle. That facility is not a miracle. Uh, miracle is a term that is way, way, way overused nowadays. But at any rate, she said that at the dedication to this new facility, uh, Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis were there. You know, a lot of people don't realize that Andrew Womack is word faith, that he's full-blown word faith, because he has this down-home persona, southern accent, kind of all shucks, kind of a, you know, personality. And uh, he, he comes across as normal, you know, just a, a normal guy, whereas Benny Hinn is anything but normal. Kenneth and Kenneth Copeland, Jesse Duplantis are anything but normal. Uh, but Andrew Womack is. But, but it says a lot about a preacher as to who he will bring in to preach from his pulpit. You know, I'm, I, I tell people, I'll go and preach anywhere. I'll, if, if the Vatican invited me to go to preach, I would do it. It'd be the first and last time I would preach at the Vatican. It'd be the first and last time I would preach at TBN if, by some <laughs> miracle, they asked me to come and uh, do something at TBN. But who you have come and fill your own pulpit says a lot about who you are and what you believe. And so they, Andrew Womack had Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland come in. Jesse Duplantis and Kenneth Copeland are two of the most obvious charlatans, false prophets, and false teachers ever to disgrace the name of Christ. I really believe with Kenneth Copeland, and I say this, I don't say this with any hyperbole, I really believe that Kenneth Copeland is demon-possessed. Kenneth Copeland has uttered some of the most jaw-dropping heresies, blood-curdling blasphemies that you could possibly imagine. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, watch my watch Clouds Without Water. I've got a, I've got a small fraction of his blasphemy and heresy. 
uh, documented it on video, but uh, he is he is truly dark. And I tell you, there is something about Kenneth Copeland's eyes. Uh, I hear this from people all the time, and there's there's times almost when you can just kind of sense the the demon coming out. It's uh, he's truly dark. So don't be fooled by Andrew Womack. Uh, he seems like a nice guy, uh, and maybe at some level he is. And we'll talk. I'll talk more about. I'll revisit that point at, towards the end of this video. But uh, he is every bit as much word faith as is Kenneth Copeland, as is Jesse Duplantis, who claims he went to heaven on a cable car and claims that he comforted Jesus. Uh, blasphemous stuff, absolute blasphemy. And yet they were the special invited guest at the dedication for this facility. It says a lot. Okay, so let us turn a corner here and talk about how I got kicked out of Karis. So we came in and we stopped at the front desk there and there was a lady and a man and we gave them our name, said that we had called ahead and we could uh, come in and look around and they were very nice and they asked us to fill out a little form and we did that and then we were asked to fill out a, a name tag, a little sticky name tag. It said uh, Karis Visitor and the blank for your name and so I wrote my name Justin Peters and you're supposed to stick it on your you know your shirt uh, I was wearing a sport coat and those little name tags don't stick well to sport coats I, I know that from experience and so I, I didn't put it on my sport coat but I did put it on the front of my little electric three-wheel scooter right by the handlebar and it was much more visible there actually it stuck stuck really well I could barely get the thing off <laughs> after we left and were kicked out. So uh, there in the front for everybody to see, uh, Karis visitor, Justin Peters. So I had that on there. And, and uh, the, the folks at the desk told us that Barry Bennett, who is their lead instructor, they're one of their um, chief instructors there, was actually doing a class at the time and we could sit in if we wanted to. And so uh, we did so, we walked in, he was teaching, two classes that morning. We got in about the last 10 minutes of the first class and then there was a little 10 minute break. And so we just stayed there for the next one. And uh, we sat there and and ironically, as you'll hear in just a minute, uh, for the second full hour, a lot of what he talked about was being, was about being uh, kind and gracious to people who disagree with you theologically. At one point he said they may not be uh, as far along spiritually as you are, something like that, but we should be nice and friendly and da-da-da-da-da. Uh, he was also talking about the role of women, which I found very interesting. And <laughs> at one point he said, uh, and I, I think I have this on audio, but anyway, uh, at one point he said that when Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2.12 that he does not allow a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man, but to remain silent, he, he actually said, that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote that, did not have full revelation at that time. That that was limited to the culture of the day that just reflected the culture of the day. And Paul had not yet been enlightened on the role of uh, women. And uh, Paul just didn't know at the time that, in fact, women can preach and pastor and do all these other things. Full-blown egalitarian position, which is very common in the word faith movement, charismatic movement in general. Uh, women teach and preach as much as the men do. Well, that's a whole other issue. But to actually say, it's like he knows he can't get around the clear meaning of the text. So uh, what he does is say, Paul just didn't have full revelation on that. This wasn't yet enlightened on a subject about which he was writing in inspired scripture, authoritative scripture, and yet somehow he just didn't yet have the full revelation. So he was he was wrong, you see. You think through the implications of a statement like that, and it is absolutely stunning. So at any rate, towards the end of the class, there was time for Q&A. They did Q&A, and it's much like I was kind of debating myself. Do I, do I ask a question? Do I not? Kind of like uh, when I confronted Todd Bentley, I was sitting there, I'll, like, do I really do this or, or not? And I was like, okay, I want to do it. And so I motored my little electric three-wheel scooter over to the to the young man who was holding the microphone for people asking questions. And sure enough, I was allowed to ask what turned out to be the final question of the class period. 
and here is how it went. Now, a, a friend of mine, one of the one of the guys in our little group there, he recorded this. I didn't know he was going to, but he did. I'm grateful that he did. So he recorded this on his iPhone. Uh, I think you'll be able to hear me pretty well. Uh, Barry Bennett, the audio is lower, so I'll put uh, kind of like closed captions or whatever, um, makeshift, so you can hear exactly what he said. Uh, you won't be able to see me because I'm kind of like around the bend and I'm low because I'm sitting down on my scooter. So uh, you won't you won't you won't see me, but you will hear my voice. Sure, thank you. Um, if it is always God's will to be physically healed, then what do we do with all the many examples in Scripture, Old and New Testament, of faithful servants of God who were not healed, who were sick and were not healed? We could look at. We could look at David. In my book, he healed them all. Not um, your well, Jesus in John chapter 5 pulled Bethesda, healed one out of the multitude. That's because they were looking to him. They were following say, him. for example. Are you going to argue with me? What are we doing here? No, I, I just like a, a... Well, I'm trying to answer you. Okay. It's okay. Okay, what's the answer? Get my book. So that was indeed very quick. It was the last question, of course, that uh, was allowed for the class period. The bell rang right after that, quite quite literally, the bell rang. So I want to play this again, and I'll uh, interrupt in a couple of points to, to uh, make some points. The question I asked, just in case you were not able to hear it, is uh, if it's always God's will to be healed, then what do we do with all of the many faithful servants of God, Old and New Testament, uh, faithful servants of God, and yet they were not healed? healed so that was the question so let's let's go through this again sure thank you um, if it is always God's will to be physically healed then what do we do with all the many examples in scripture old and new testament of faithful servants of God who were not healed who were sick and were not healed we could look at we could look at David my book he healed them all not um, your so Bennett's response to my question was get my book, he healed them all, that will answer your question. And he has indeed written a book by that title, He Healed Them All. And that is one of the common beliefs amongst word faith folks, that Jesus healed everyone, that he never turned anyone down for healing. And while it is true that he never turned anyone down, it is not true that he healed them all, as in every sick person with whom he came into contact. That is manifestly not true. And when I heard him say that, uh, I brought up then the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5. Well, Jesus in John chapter 5 pulled Bethesda, healed one out of the multitude. That's because they were looking to him. They were following say for example. Okay, so Barry Bennett says that the reason that only this sick man, who had been sick for 38 years, and none of the other of the multitude of the sick and lame and blind and withered were healed, was that it was only this fellow who was looking to Jesus. None of the others were looking to Jesus, according to Barry Bennett. But dear friends, this is a completely untenable position. In John chapter 5, the Pool of Bethesda, this was an area just north of the Temple Mount. And you'll see in your Bibles that it is described as having five colonnades or five covered porticos. And uh, this is actually a picture that I myself took of the Pool of Bethesda back in 2018 when I was there on a trip to Israel. Uh, this is it. And you see one of those five colonnades or porticos that is still completely or at least mostly intact and in some of the remnants of the other ones. So this is, this is where it all happened here in John chapter 5. There was, of course, back in the day, water at the bottom of this. There's not now. So um, this is it. Now, You'll notice in your Bible, in the last part of verse 3, and then into verse 4, it says that uh, this, and this should be in brackets, okay, in your Bible. It says, waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever sickness with which he was afflicted. And so the reason this is in brackets is because this this phrase, this sentence, is not in the oldest and therefore most reliable Greek manuscripts. So in all likelihood, this is a scribal edition uh, that some scribe put in there, at kind of like a commentary uh, of sorts. So it's not part of the original manuscripts and not inspired. So this was not really an angel of the Lord, a holy angel that came and troubled the waters. 
what was going on at the Pool of Bethesda is that this was an area of uh, Greek pagan healing. The Greeks created a pagan deity of healing known as Asclepius. And so it wasn't really a, a holy angel, an angel of Yahweh. This was a, a Asclepius that came and troubled the water, supposedly. That was the that was the mythology that was built around this. And that's why there were so many of the sick and lame and withered and blind who were gathered around this supposed, uh, these waters of healing, supposedly. Uh, so... <laughs> Not not only were the, the rest of the multitude not looking for Jesus or not looking to Jesus, as he said, as Barry Bennett said, neither was this guy. They weren't looking to Jesus. They were looking for Asclepius. That's who they were looking for. This guy didn't have any idea who Jesus was. So he wasn't looking to Jesus. He didn't know who Jesus was. And lest you doubt that, the text tells us very clearly. Let's look at it. John chapter 5, let's begin in verse 10. So the Jews were saying to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. This, of course, obviously after Jesus had healed him. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your mat and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your mat and walk? Now look at this. But the man who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. He wasn't looking to Jesus either. Didn't even know who he was. So how can you say that the man who had been sick for 38 years was looking to Jesus? He didn't know Jesus from Adam's house cat. Didn't know who he was. He's just wrong. Flat out wrong. And um, my question did not sit well with Barry Bennett as we'll now see. Are you going to argue with me? What are we doing here? No, I, I just like a... a... Well, I'm trying to answer you. Okay. It's okay. Okay, what's the answer? Get my book. So Barry Bennett said, are you going to argue with me? What are we doing here? And I said, I just want an answer to my question. He said, I'm trying to answer your question. I said, okay. And then he said, get my book. That was his answer. Get my book. Now, in fairness, it was right at the end of the class and you heard the bell ring, literally. Uh, but what was really interesting is what happened after this. Right after the bell rang, um, there were several people that came up to me. The first one was a young man by the name of Hudson. Now, I, this is a picture of Hudson, and uh, I've, I've already talked with him and gotten his permission to, to show this picture and even include his name. Uh, Hudson came up to me, and uh, just an exceptionally nice young man, and he said, you're Justin Peters. And I said, I said, yeah, I am. I was kind of initially thinking, uh oh, this is probably not going to be good given the environment that I was in where I was at. But he said, uh, I've been watching your YouTube channel for the last couple of months. And he was very complimentary, he told me that he's learned a lot and has been uh, my YouTube material has been answering a lot of his questions. And he's just, and he realizes that there are some serious problems in the theology there at Karis. Just a very nice young man. And he actually came to the last night of my seminar at Highland Bible Church. He and a friend of his came. And um, and then after that service, we, we talked some more. And just um, really, not, I was really, really encouraged. I was not expecting that, but uh, really, really encouraged by Hudson. And so um, after Hudson, this a uh, young lady came up to me. This is a picture of her. Uh, one of my friends who was with me was taking these pictures unbeknownst to me, but anyway, I, I have them now. And uh, this young lady came up to me and she said, may I pray for you? And uh, I said, well, if you're going to pray for my healing, then then no, thanks, but no thanks, basically. I said, there's been thousands of people who have prayed for my healing over the course of my life. And I said, I have prayed for it before, but now I am quite content in uh, God's providence for my life. And, you know, if God chooses to heal me, he certainly can. Uh, but if not, if I have to live the rest of my life with cerebral palsy, that's fine. I've got all of eternity to live without it. And some, many of you have heard me say that before, and I mean it. Uh, so I, I declined, and I, I uh, meant no offense to her, but I, uh, I'm... Uh, 
praying is a obviously a spiritual enterprise, and uh, I'm not going to pray with someone uh, with whom I have significant theological differences. And uh, it was, of course, very evident that she, um, unlike Hudson, she was fully devoted to word faith theology. Uh, very nice young lady. Um, I engaged her in her arguments, as did the pastor, Jeff Gwynn. He and I both did. Um, but it, 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 was, it was clear in, in talking, listening, listening to Barry Bennett and then engaging with a, a couple of the students at... Uh, that they're they're not taught well. Uh, there there's massive gaping holes in their theology, which springs from uh, very flawed hermeneutics. Uh, but then, after her, this other couple walked up. I'm assuming they're a couple. There's a man and a woman. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just friends, or I don't know. But um, very very nice. And uh, the the lady said. She actually apologized. She said, I'm, I'm really sorry for the way you were treated, the way Barry Bennett treated you. And, and I said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's okay. I'm, you know, and I said, people who are, who are teaching bad doctrine don't like to be challenged, and that is absolutely true. Uh, but she was, she was apologetic. She felt badly for me the way that I was treated. It, it really kind of like water off a duck's back for me. I, uh, it didn't. It didn't bother me. What bothers me is that I see all of these students over. I guess around a thousand of them or so that are that are being taught bad theology, bad doctrine, and bad hermeneutics. And but she said, she said I have questions too. And she said a lot of us do. So their and their their questions are not really being answered. They're either being, you know, um, dismissed or skirted in some way. But they're. In other words, a lot of the students there have some real questions. They know that things just aren't adding up uh, in word faith theology, and they don't add up. They they don't make sense, and um, apparently uh, their questions are not being answered. So that was actually very encouraging to me to to hear that and to see that to know that uh, by God's grace. My teaching is, is making an impact and other YouTube channels, Polite Leader and Chris Rosebro and uh, Stephen Kozar, The Messed Up Church and uh, Andreas Widget, I hope I'm saying that right, brother, uh, and, and others, uh, Bezel T3, Bezel 3T, Bezel T3. Uh, some, I may be leaving some out, uh, so I don't mean to. But anyways, these, some of the, these YouTube channels, mine and others uh, that do some similar work as to mine, they're they're having an impact. And uh, I, so I left encouraged in that regard. So uh, praise the Lord for that. But then, okay, here's where I got kicked out. So after this couple, then uh, a security guard came up to me and he said, are you Justin Peters? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, are you aware that you're trespassing? And I'm like, no, I was not aware at all that I was trespassing. And so um, that went into a conversation. He asked, how did we get in there? And I kind of looked at Jeff Gwynn and, and uh, Jeff explained that he had called and talked to a lady and gave the lady's name. I, I won't. Uh, gave the lady's name and uh, said that we can come in. You know, we went past the security guard, checked in with them, got in, went to the front desk, uh, filled out the forms, got her little name tags and again my name sticker was uh sticking right on the front of my scooter there and and so uh but anyway apparently he said that uh dr dr Bootendog, he is the, the dean of students there at karis uh, he's from south africa but apparently uh a year or so ago he issued a, an order an edict or whatever you want to call it that uh banned yours truly from Karis Bible College, and uh, I had no idea. But kind of in putting the pieces of the puzzle together, apparently this he probably made this decision after I put up my uh, first video, my visit to Karis nine months or so ago. So uh, that's the best I can tell. But anyway, this was complete news to me, and I told the security guard, who was very nice, by the way, and uh, I told him, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I had no idea. This is complete news to me. We, you know, we did everything by the book. Here's my name tag and all that. And uh, so um, he was very polite and he said, well, I'm, and he almost actually seemed kind of apologetic. 
And he said, I'm, I'm just doing my job. And I said, no, I, I completely understand. And I, I get that. And you're doing your job. And he asked if he could escort us out. And so he did that. I had to stop by the little boy's room first. But, um, yeah, and so we, and so we walked out. And um, he, he, he was very nice. So um, I, I will say that everybody that I talked to there was nice. They were nice people. Um, but they are being taught bad theology, bad doctrine. Word faith theology is biblically bankrupt. It is a, a false gospel. And, and I've also heard a number of stories coming out of Karis uh, that are heartbreaking. Uh, they make the claim that a couple of years ago, a few years ago, that there was a baby, a dead baby, raised from the dead at one of their healing crusades at Karis. This couple, the claim is, drove their baby from New York into Colorado. And at some point along the way, the baby died. And um, the parents brought this baby who was dead up to the platform. Uh, and Andrew, if we could just mention real quickly about the healing conference. Um, I was going to want to give a testimony. We just had 2,500 people here at our facility, mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was pretty much full. That's what they said. I, I thought it was more than that. But anyway, it was awesome. We saw a little baby raised from the dead. Praise the God. baby wow. baby was dead, and the mother just came and put the baby on the stage, and we prayed, and this baby came back to life. And in fact, just the other day, watching their live stream on YouTube, uh, one of their one of their professors made reference to the story and said that the the baby's lips were blue. I mean, the baby was dead, and then they laid hands on the baby and came back to life. Just came back to life. Now, folks, that, I'm sorry, that doesn't pass the smell test. There's no documentation of this. The website that reported this story got in contact with Karis and asked them, they saw this claim and they asked them, do you have proof of this? And F Karis finally responded to their emails and said this, uh, quote, unfortunately, the session with the baby being healed, resurrected, not just healed, the session with the baby being healed was not recorded as the healing occurred when a private panel was taking place at the conference. I don't believe that at all. That's a lie. Uh, this Daniel Amstutz just the other day talked about this healing. Listen, when that mama from New York brought that baby up during uh, the, the Healing is Here conference, um, man, you remember that, Jeremiah? You know, several of you were at the gym, you were there, and we were rolling out Healing University, and she just walked right up this aisle right here, and was distraught over the fact that her baby had just died during the meeting. Well, we didn't know what had happened. I mean, we just saw this mother coming up with her child. We thought maybe he had a cold or whatever, you know. Well, she comes up here and she, she's crying. And so Carly was the first person to jump off of her chair and come over here, and I did as well. And I think the whole team eventually came over and surrounded this baby. But let me just tell you from my experience what happened, okay? Because it was all slightly different depending on perspective. When I saw the baby, it was obvious the baby's lips were completely blue and the baby was not breathing. There was no signs of life whatsoever. And as we began to minister over this baby, I don't exactly remember what I said or how I said it because it doesn't even matter, honestly. What matters is I was simply giving forth what I was hearing in my spirit. And I said something along these lines. I said, in the name of Jesus, baby, breathe. You will live and not die. And when I put my hands on that baby's chest, the baby's hands flew up and started breathing just like that. Pretty dramatic story, is it not? A baby raised from the dead, blue lips, not breathing, raised from the dead. And let's remember that Andrew Womack said there were 2,500 people at this conference. And yet there's no video of this. How is that possible? I texted Hudson and I asked him if he had heard about this story. And he said, yes. And I said, uh, the school has 
uh, they responded to this uh, news article and said that they have no recording of it. And when I told him that there was no, the school claims there's no recording of this resurrection, he said this, and I'll read it to you, strange, not surprising, but strange. They video absolutely everything there pretty much, and when not, they still get audio. And if this was a conference, they certainly would have, would have at least three different angles of video. And he said, if it happened, there's documented evidence somewhere in that school. And yet there appears to be none. Not only did the school not record it for some odd reason, but friends, 2,500 people there in attendance, all of whom have smartphones. We live in a day and age in which everyone has a smartphone and they record everything. People record what they have for lunch. They record, you know, mid-morning snack or something. I mean, every and, and yet nobody has video or even audio of a resurrection from the dead? I'm sorry. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And until they can prove prove this, until they offer some proof, I stand by my accusation that they are lying about this, that Karis is lying. And not only that, but uh, people being raised from the dead, well, apparently, according to Andrew Womack, this is a common occurrence with him. Listen to this. My own son was raised from the dead. He was dead for five hours and in a morgue, uh, stripped naked with a tote tag on. And um, they called me and Jamie and I just spoke our faith and he sat up and started talking. Raised <laughs> wow. from the dead, no brain damage, no more than he had before. <laughs> and we see blind eyes open. We have people, there was two people in the production that were in wheelchairs when they came to the Bible school. And after sitting under the word, it wasn't me praying for them as such. It was just them learning the truth. You know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the mm -hmm. truth shall make you free. And when they learned the truth and learned what was rightfully theirs and the authority that they had, they came out of the wheelchairs on their own, and now they were in this production and some of the actors in it. On and on we could go. I mean, we have... Uh, I couldn't even tell you for sure, but I know 30 to 40 people that I know personally who have been raised from the dead or who have raised another person from the dead. He knows 30 to 40 people who were either raised from the dead or raised someone from the dead. 30 to 40? And yet, I mean, come on. Where, where's the proof? Where is the proof of this? There should be at, at least a couple of these ought to be thoroughly documented. Where's the proof? That is just astonishing. And, and you know, when I heard him say that, I immediately had a bit of a, a theological PTSD because there's another guy, another charismatic, who made uh, almost the exact same claim several years ago, back in 2008 in Lakeland, Florida. You might remember him, Todd Bentley. Todd Bentley made the exact same claim. He said we had 30, 30 or 35 people raised from the dead. said that he had proof of it. And he was asked by a news organization to provide said proof, and he couldn't. Nary a one. Todd Bentley, this is a guy who is dark. I mean, really dark. This is a guy who claims that God told him to kick an elderly woman in the face with his biker boot. Yeah. So he made the same claim. Andrew Womack may come across as a all shucks kind of a guy, but um, but he's thoroughly word faith. He makes these wild claims about raising people from the dead and knowing people who are raised from the dead, and yet there is no proof. In a day and age when everybody has a smartphone, no proof. Andrew Womack is no stranger to making some very impressive, spectacular claims, one of which he made in March of 2020. This is when COVID was really getting ramped up and much in the news, and he did a program, put it on his YouTube channel, and you can watch it right now if you would like to. Go back to March of 2020, and you should find it. Uh, listen to the claim that he made here. 
Instead of having this fear about everybody contaminating me, man, I look at it this way, that I've got the supernatural power of God living on the inside of me. And if I come in with sickness, I can reach out and touch, touch them and healed. my healing will be transmitted instead of their sickness. So Andrew Womack is so confident that he will not only not contract COVID, but he's so confident in his own faith that he believes that he can, he can reach out and touch someone with COVID in the healing power, the virtue will go forth from Andrew Womack into the sick person and that person will be healed. Really? Well, it's interesting that he would make that motion towards Carrie Pickett. Carrie Pickett is the vice president or assistant vice president and director of the Global Training School at Karis. It's interesting he would kind of reach towards her because from what I was told while I was there, Carrie Pickett actually contracted COVID. Well, he didn't just reach out and heal her, now did he? Uh, Barry Bennett, the teacher that I asked the question to, uh, he got COVID. In fact, not only did he have COVID, but it's, uh, I was also told that he had cancer and he was out for much of a better part of a year with cancer. So why didn't Andrew Womack just reach out and heal his own instructor, his own staff member, his own employee. Why didn't he do that? We've been watching the clip from Daniel Amstutz. And as he's teaching on healing, look at what he's got on his face. Eyeglasses. So he teaches that it's always God's will to be healed, and yet he wears eyeglasses. So we are supposed to have enough faith to be healed of muscular dystrophy or multiple sclerosis or cancer or arthritis or um, Lou Gehrig's disease or, or whatever it is. And yet, he's got eyeglasses. Friends, never trust a faith healer who's wearing eyeglasses. Good rule of thumb. And I was also told by Hudson that COVID ran through the whole school uh, this past January. January 2022, December 2021, January 2022. Remember when the Omicron variant was all the all the buzz and, and it ran through the whole country? Well, guess what? It ran through Karis Bible College too, just as much as it did in the general populace. And when I was there the other day, I kind of looked around and I noticed that uh, there were just as many students at Karis Bible College wearing eyeglasses as what you would expect to find out in the general populace. Just as many, a whole bunch of Karis Bible students wearing eyeglasses. Why? Why? It's supposed to be healed of cancer and muscular dystrophy, but they can't be healed of a little nearsightedness. You see, what the faith preachers preach doesn't even work for them. And if what the faith preachers preach doesn't work for them, then that ought to be a clue to them. There just might be something wrong with what they're preaching. A few moments ago, we listened to the uh, audio of Andrew Womack saying that he knows 30 to 40 people who were either raised from the dead or who raised someone from the dead. I've heard the story of this baby that was brought up on the platform, raised from the dead, supposedly. Well, with that in mind, I, I want to show you the end of the video clip that I've showed a little bit ago, the young lady walking around showing us all the facilities. Uh, there's a short segment right at the tail end of that clip, and it's actually very sad, but I want to show it to you in light of the claims that we've just heard from Womack, Amstutz, and Barry Bennett. Uh, I take no joy in this. I just, I just present it to you as a matter of fact. With all we've just heard, claims of people being raised from the dead, 30 to 40 of them. Watch. Oh. Robert Ummel, nicknamed Grumpy, I guess, 
was killed on January the 28th, 2019. He was the construction supervisor for Karis Bible College. He headed up that enormous construction project. I heard about this story as I was at Woodland Park at this at this church, and um, then I, I Googled it and got a, a few more details. So he apparently was killed on site in a forklift accident. Best I can tell, the forklift capsized somehow and crushed him, I think. Uh, medical personnel, of course, were called 911, and they came and they tried to save his life, tried to revive him, uh, resuscitate him, but, but um, they weren't able to. He died. That is sad. Uh, from what I read, he's a, a very nice man. So I take absolutely no joy in that. It's a heartbreaking thing, and I, I feel for his family. I truly do, and I have prayed for that man's family. I don't know anything about him. But dear friends... Andrew Womack claims that he knows 30 to 40 people raised from the dead or who have raised people from the dead. Claims that a baby, dead, a, a dead baby was brought up onto this platform at his own conference and they raised him from the dead. Like this, this is something that should be happening regularly. And yet, it did not happen for this gentleman. The claims they make are unsubstantiated. What they claim to believe does not even work for them. It does not work for them. Fact of the matter is, dear ones, is that the Bible is full of examples of faithful servants of God who were sick and were not healed. Moses, David, it was good for Psalm 1971, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach and your frequent ailments. Paul left Trophimus sick at Miletus. Paul didn't heal him. He didn't lay hands on him, didn't heal him. He healed others, couldn't heal Trophimus. Left him sick. Paul himself, Galatians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Paul said that he had a bodily illness. And Elisha. I mean, there are many others we could cite, but Elisha. I mean, this Elisha, the great prophet Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 13, died of a sickness. He got sick and he died of that sickness. And there are many, many more we could cite. The Bible is full of examples of people like this. Faithful servants of God who were not healed. Do I believe that God still heals people today? Yes, I do. But only when it is his sovereign will to do so. Is it always God's will for us to be healed? No, it is not. God wasn't healing everyone in the days of the Bible, and he's not doing it today either. Sometimes God is most glorified in us, not when things are going well, not when our bodies are in tip-top shape, not when there's plenty of money in the bank, not when everything is sunshine, lollipops, and unicorns, but sometimes God is most glorified in us when we suffer, when we are persecuted, and yes, when we are sick, and yet through the suffering, through the persecution, through the sickness, we remain faithful to Christ and we honor Him. Sometimes God is most glorified in us in times like that. And friends, I cannot tell you how many stories I have heard. I have talked in the last number of years since I've been doing this, I have talked to literally thousands of people. I have heard from them I've gotten emails, I've gotten letters, I've talked to them in person. Thousands, that is not hyperbole, thousands of people whose lives have been all but devastated by this false theology, who have been told that the reason they're sick is because they haven't done something right. They don't have enough faith. They haven't made the right positive confessions. They haven't given enough money. They haven't sown enough seed into some minister's ministry so they could reap a, a harvest of healing. I can't not tell you how many people have told me, Justin, my mom and my dad were in this movement and my mom and my dad gave their life savings to Kenneth Copeland or to Andrew Womack or to Benny Hinn or one of these others, literally giving them their life savings. Some of them 
completely emptied their bank accounts because they were sick, because they had cancer. And they are constantly being told, like the proverbial carrot on a stick, just a little bit more, just hang on, just a little bit more, just a little bit more faith, just a little bit more positive confession, just a little bit more giving. And your healing's right around the corner. It is a wicked, wicked lie. This movement has, has no understanding of, of suffering for the glory of God. Absolutely not. It is bankrupt when it comes to its theology of suffering. It has no provision for suffering for the glory of God. Philippians 1.29, For to you not only has it been granted to believe in Christ, but to suffer for his name's sake. That... that they have no provision for that. They have no provision for Psalm 119, 71. They have no provision for 2 Corinthians 11, uh, beginning in verse 23, going down, I don't have it in front of me, but down about verse 30, 31 or so. I mean, look at that. Look at the kind of suffering that Paul went through. They have no theology of suffering. And it's a shame. It is a real shame. Is our healing provided for in the atonement? Yes. Yes, it is. But not all of the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. A glorified body is also provided for in the atonement. But I don't see anybody walking around today with their glorified bodies. Not anybody at Karis. Not anybody following Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland. Nobody is walking around with their glorified bodies. Why not? It's been provided for in the atonement but it's not promised to be realized here. And friends, think about this. Think about this logically. If the sick were really being healed at Karis, and I'm not talking about a psychosomatic healing, I'm talking about a real healing, organic healing. I'm talking about amputees growing new limbs. I'm talking about people being uh, born blind with instant 2020 vision. I'm talking about... Uh, last stage cancer instantly disappearing. I'm talking about Lou Gehrig's disease instantly disappearing. Uh, I mean, real healings. Real healings that can only be explained by a genuine miracle, a genuine miracle of God. Like the miracles that we see in the New Testament, those kind of miracles. If that was really happening, if the sick were really being healed at Karis, if the dead were really being raised at Karis, Woodland Park, Colorado, would not be this little sleepy town of seven or 8,000 people. It would be the biggest city in the country. You wouldn't be able to pit, fit people in there with a shoehorn. I mean, there would literally be millions of people flocking to Woodland Park if they were real healings and there was any proof of this happening. Think about it. It's not happening. It's not true. I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, for those of you who are CARA students or students of Valor Christian College or RAMA or ORU or something like that, and you're being told that it's always God's will to be healed, I know a lot of you watching right now, I know you have questions. I know you do. The Bible has answers, but what you're being taught is not biblical. It is not biblical, and it's going to do you an awful lot of harm, and it's going to do, if you teach this to others, it's going to do them an awful lot of harm. It distorts the gospel. No provision for God's sufficient grace or strength made perfect in weakness. Um, uh, I know you have questions, and for anyone who is watching this right now in the Woodland Park area, if you have questions, um, I would commend to you, Highland Bible Church, uh, pastored by Jeff Gwynn. I will put a link to his church down below in the description. And uh, he has told me, and, I've, and I saw him interacting with Hudson, and uh, um, it just thrilled his soul to talk to Hudson. So um, anyway, if, you, if you're in that area and you have questions, I could commend a Highland Bible Church to you. Good church, taught by good, solid men, biblically qualified men. Um, so all right, dear ones. 
The true gospel, dear ones, is not about health and wealth. The true gospel is this, is that you are a sinner, I am a sinner. We have all broken God's laws. We have incurred the righteous, holy wrath of God. And if we die in our sins, we will very rightly and very justly go to a very real place that the Bible calls hell. But God has made a way for you to escape his wrath. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, fully God, fully man. And Jesus laid his life down on the cross. He had done nothing wrong. His life was not taken. He gave it. And on the cross, this perfect person offered his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God. Died on the cross three days later, bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And if you will repent of sin and place your trust in Christ and what he did on the cross, he will save you. If you will come to Christ in that godly sorrow that the Apostle Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, a godly sorrow in which you truly grieve over your sin, if you will come to Christ and grieving over your sin, as much as you want a Savior from hell, you should want a Savior from sin. If you'll come to Christ seeking a Savior, not only from hell, but from sin itself, He will save you. You will pass from death to life. And on this earth, we're not promised money. We're not promised healing. We are promised persecution. We are also promised His sufficient grace, His strength made perfect in our weakness through this short vapor of a life. And in heaven, we are promised to enjoy Christ for all of eternity. That is the good news of the gospel. And if you will come to Christ, he will save you. Thank you very much, dear ones. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all.